Mathematically, when we say chaos, we don't mean that a system is necessarily random or disordered. Instead, we mean that it is very sensitive to small fluctuations. Our classic example is the double pendulum. If you try releasing it from the same position twice, after some time the trajectories will become completely different. The smallest of changes in your placement of the pendulum will lead to this, no matter how accurate you try to be. But this is a continuous system. The position of the pendulum evolves continually through time governed by some differential equation. Are there functions that behave chaotically in a discrete system, defined instead through iteration? And is there a simple condition that leads to such chaos? In this video, we'll answer this question by exploring a fascinating result related to such discrete chaotic systems. To start, we have to define what we mean when we talk about the behavior of a function through iteration. What we are actually talking about is a sequence, x0, x1, and so on, where there's a function that takes one value in a sequence and gives the next value. For convenience, we define f of f of x as f squared of x, and f of f of f of x is f cubed of x, and so on. So x sub n is equal to f to the n of x0. Then here would be our function f, and here would be the sequence generated by our initial x value. However, we don't need to start a sequence at some fixed point. We could choose any value for x0 to start it at, and in this way we can define a continuous function which gives an infinite number of possible sequences. Of course, these recursive sequences can behave in all sorts of ways, but one intriguing feature such a sequence can have is periodicity. Say for instance we have a point with period 3, meaning the sequence repeats every 3 entries, so that f cubed of x0 is equal to x0, but it doesn't repeat with less than 3 iterations. The sequence generated by such a point is x0, x1, x2, x0, and so on. What might a point with period 3 tell us about other sequences given by the same function? As you may initially guess, absolutely nothing. You can probably come up with all sorts of weird functions where one point with period 3 has absolutely no significance on the other points in the function. Okay, this probably isn't too surprising, but here's a follow-up question. Let's say we had a continuous function with a point with period 3. What does a point with period 3 imply about the other sequence given by the same continuous function? It turns out this new continuous condition guarantees there exists a point with every period possible. That is to say, there's a point with period 5, a point with period 2023, 20, a point with period equal to the number of views of this video, and in general, for every positive integer n, there exists a point with period n. Just to be clear, this is different than saying every point is periodic. In fact, as you'll see, something closer to the opposite is true. The name for this theorem is period 3 implies chaos. At first, this just seems like a mathematician's version of clickbait, which is kind of true, but this name is actually quite fitting. To better understand this theorem, let's give some things names. Let's call it the point with period 3 A, and f of a equals b, f of b equals c, and f of c equals a. It's pretty easy to show that all of a, b, and c have period 3. So since we picked a arbitrarily, we'll assume that a is actually the smallest of these three numbers. This makes it so we now only have two cases. However, these cases are symmetric, and the proofs would be nearly identical, so let's just assume without loss of generality that a is less than b is less than c. If we were to graph f, we know the location of three points, but we are still missing a lot of information. There are infinitely many possible continuous functions that pass through these points, each of which will generate different sequences when we change x0. However, we can notice some things in common across all of these functions. We can see, no matter what function we're looking at, the function crosses every point in the interval b to c. In other words, for every point y1 in the interval b c, there's at least one point in a b such that f of x1 is equal to y1. Similarly, the function crosses again every point in the interval a c. 
For every point y2 in the interval ac, there is at least one point in the interval bc such that f of x2 is equal to y2. You may recognize this as the intermediate value theorem, which we'll see in more depth in a few moments. Importantly, because the second interval wraps over itself as we apply f, we can notice there must be some points in bc that stay in bc after applying f to them. So the key insight is you could pick a point p in this interval such that repeatedly applying f to p, p will bounce around in bc for some time. But eventually, for some k, f to the k of p leaves the interval bc and lands in the interval ab. And we could construct p carefully in such a way that f to the k plus 1 of p comes back to the interval bc and lands on our original point p. Because after k plus 1 iterations of f, p lands on itself, this p necessarily has period k plus 1. And if we change k to whatever we want, we can find points with every possible period. This is all pretty hand wavy, but as you'll see shortly, this intuitive idea built on noticing how points in these different intervals move is really the core of the proof. However, to make this a bit more vigorous, let's take a deeper look at the intermediate value theorem. You've probably encountered this theorem before, but as a brief recap, recall that the intermediate value theorem says that if g is a continuous function and an interval a, b is in the domain of g, then the interval g of a to g of b is in the range of g. In other words, for any k between g of a and g of b, the line y equal k necessarily crosses g. This theorem may seem so obvious, it seems hardly worth stating, but when taken out of context, its implications become more subtle. There are three important corollaries for what we're doing today. Firstly, g of the interval a, b always will contain the interval g of a to g of b. If you're not familiar with this notation, it means that if we look at the output of g at every point in the interval a, b, the interval you form, which we will call g of a b will contain the interval g of a to g of b. By the intermediate value theorem, we know g takes on every value in the interval g of a to g of b. So by definition, the interval g of a to g of b must be a part of g of the interval a to b. Our second corollary, if g of some interval i contains a smaller interval i prime, there's an interval in i q such that g of q is exactly i prime. You can almost think of this as an extension of the intermediate value theorem in that instead of finding a specific point, we're looking for an interval. By the intermediate value theorem, we know there exists p and q and i such that the interval g of p to g of q is equal to i prime. We'll assume that p is less than q, but you can imagine a very similar argument if p was greater than q. Now let r be the last value in the interval p q such that g of r is equal to g of p. And let s be the first value after r, such that g of s is equal to g of q. Then by how we constructed r and s, g of the interval r s is exactly i prime. Finally, our third corollary. Let's say we have a function such that g of a b contains the interval a b. Then we can know there is some point in g where g of that point is equal to itself, also known as a fixed point. Visually, a fixed point would mean the line y equal x must cross g, which we can see should be true, but recognizing how the intermediate value theorem implies this might not be quite as intuitive. Let's take a look at the function g of x minus x and call it h of x. We know g of c equals a for some c between a and b. If c equals a, then a is a fixed point. Otherwise, c has to be greater than a, so h of c is negative. Similarly, g of d equals b for some d between a and b. If d equals b, b is a fixed point. Otherwise, d would have to be less than b, so h of d is positive. But if h of c is less than 0 and h of d is greater than 0, by the intermediate value theorem, there is some p between c and d for which h of p is equal to 0. And this makes p a fixed point. Now we can return to our main proof. Remember, we are trying to prove that if there exists some point a on a continuous function f, 
such that a is period 3, then for every positive integer n, there exists a point on f with period n. Let's examine what happens to the intervals a, b, and b, c under f. From our first corollary of the intermediate value theorem, f of the interval a, b contains the interval f of a to f of b, which is just the interval b, c. In other words, for every value y in b, c, we know there's a point x in a, b such that f of that point is y. Similarly, if we look at f of the interval b, c, we know this contains the interval f of b to f of c, which is the interval a, c. Remember that we're going to show there's some point p in the interval b, c that essentially bounces around in b, c for as long as we want. Will our i0 be the interval b, c? By the second corollary, because f of i0 contains itself, there's some interval i1 in i0 such that f of i1 is equal to i0. And again, i1 is in i0, so f of i1 contains i1. So there's an interval i2 in i1 such that f of i2 is equal to i1. Then there's an interval i3 in i2 such that f of i3 is equal to i2, and so on, where f of ik is equal to i of k minus 1. In this way, we've constructed a sequence such that ik is a part of ik minus 1, and iterating f k times ik becomes i0. For example, f to the power of 3 of i3 is equal to i0. Notice how this means if you pick any point in the interval ik, it will stay in bc as you iterate f. Then because f of i0 contains the interval ab, by the second corollary again, there's some interval j in bc such that f of j is equal to ab. So now, pick any k you want, and because f to the k of ik is equal to i0, which contains j, the sum interval j prime in ik such that f to the k of j prime is equal to j. Therefore, since f of j is equal to ab, we know f to the k plus 1 of j prime is equal to ab. However, we also know f of the interval a, b contains b, c, which contains j prime. So f to the k plus 2 of j prime, which is f of a, b, contains j prime. But by our third corollary, if g of j prime contains j prime, there must be a point p in j prime such that g of p is equal to p. In this case, g is just f to the k plus 2, which means there's a point p such that f to the k plus 2 of p is equal to p. Then we'll just let n equal k plus 2. We know p has period exactly n because by construction, once every exactly n iterations, it enters a, b, so it cannot have a smaller period. We're so close. The only detail left to sort out is to show there's a point with period 1 since n is at least 2. However, by our third corollary, because f of the interval b, c contains itself, there must be a point p in b, c so that f of p is equal to p. But with this out of the way, we've indeed proven that if there's a point with period 3, then there's a point with every possible period. Just to recap how we proved this, firstly, we saw that because f has a point with period 3, f of a, b contains b, c and f of bc contains ac. Then, we created a sequence of intervals that progressively became smaller, where f of one of the intervals gives you the next interval in the sequence. Iteratively applying f, each interval in the sequence will eventually become bc. Next, we showed there's an interval that's a subset of the final interval in the sequence that becomes AB, which then contains BC. But by the intermediate value theorem, this means this interval must have a point which remains the same after repeatedly applying F, so we have a periodic point. Then based on the number of intervals in the sequence, we could make this point of any period we want. So having a single point with period 3 means we can have a point with every possible period. If you're like me, you probably have many questions at this point, like what is special about 3? Does period 5 imply all periods? 
And if you look carefully back at our proof, the problem is we can't order five elements the same way. We can't say A less than B less than C for period five. There are many possible orderings. And the same is true for all numbers besides three. Here's, for example, a function where there's a point with period five, but you could verify there's no point with period three. That being said, there's a generalization of this result called Tchaikovsky's theorem, which gives an ordering of all natural numbers, where if there's a number with some period, there's a number with every period located after that number on the list. So period five doesn't imply all periods, but it does imply every period besides three. And the first number on the list, three, must imply every other period. Of course, to prove Tchaikovsky's theorem, there are a number of details to work out, which we won't go into today. But the main idea is really just an extension of what we've already done. If you're like me, this theorem itself is already very beautiful. But it does actually have important implications in another quite interesting area of math, chaos. We proved that there are infinitely many periodic points of a function. And it turns out this implies there's an uncountable number of points which behave chaotically, never approaching a periodic point. Intuitively, this is because there are periodic points arbitrarily close together, and in between these points, there may be regions where behavior is unpredictable. Remember when we constructed periodic points? We showed there's a periodic point with period j plus 2 in the interval ij. And since for all k greater than or equal to j, ik is in the interval ij, the interval ij must also contain a point with period k plus 2. So in this small interval, there are an infinite number of points with vastly different orbits. And in between two periodic points, there's a region where sequences don't approach either periodic orbit. Then instead of having a predictable orbit, a point in this interval may well have a completely different period, or bounce around randomly as we apply f. Okay, so what does this mean? This implies from some initial point, if you move even a tiny bit or fail to measure this initial state with infinite precision, the resulting sequence may become very different from the initial sequence. But you don't even need to see something with period 3 to know f is chaotic in this way. Remember when we said f of c is equal to a? Our proof above works as long as f of c is less than or equal to a. So any function where the output grows two consecutive times before falling before the initial value must be chaotic. Okay, chaos is cool and all, but why do we care? Is this ever actually relevant to the real world? Yes. Iterative functions are often used to describe things as they progress through time. However, in many such systems, you may not be able to perfectly measure the initial conditions. And this is why understanding chaos can be important. If such a system is chaotic, then these inaccuracies in measuring initial conditions means predicting future states is impossible. As a more concrete example, imagine a mountain covered in snow. Every night it snows some fixed amount, and we want to know when avalanches will occur. A function takes in snow depth one day and outputs snow depth the next. When snow depth decreases, it means that there is an avalanche. When it decreases drastically, there is a big avalanche. Knowing snow depth one day, can we predict when large avalanches will occur? For example, to give skiers an early warning that they should not be on the slopes one day? The theorem we just proved says no, we cannot predict when large avalanches will occur. As long as it does not avalanche every day and snow can build up, small inaccuracies in measurement may result in very different forecasts. There are of course many more uses of this theorem, from random number generators to financial markets and from population growth to plasma physics. But the overarching reason that this theorem can be applied to so many situations is it gives us some way to study local behavior in order to better understand how a function behaves globally. By understanding the mathematics of functions in this way, we gain a very powerful tool that helps us understand all sorts of real-world phenomena to a greater extent.